Yeah, definitely in the post-war era where things are ramping up. Uh, we had a lot of connecting railroads. Um, it was really the backbone for many logging railroads. Pacific Lumber Company, um, the Arcadia and Mad River Railroad, one of my favorite railroads, uh, the Northern Redwood Lumber Company, and the Hammond Lumber Company, just to name a few. This is pretty much what was existing, I would say, probably post-war. Um, this is the Arcadia and Mad River. We actually own that number seven, and that's our speeder that we operate for Timber Heritage. Um, it's worth noting that in the 1950s, the 7.5 mile Arcadia and Mad River Railroad had 15 customers, and that tiny little railroad would sometimes take eight hours to switch. That's how many cars they were running. Which means, I've actually read that um, it was one, at one point, a uh, dollar per mile, it was one of the most profitable railroads in the US, because they're so short. Pacific Lumber Company, um, if you've been by Scotia, you know that most of these tracks are gone, uh, but some of the equipment survived. So we do actually have some of the flat cars out of Samoa, and we do have that uh, caboose that was just recently re-roofed and painted. And then I love this picture. Uh, this is the Pacific Lumber Company uh, engine house. I'm not going to call it a round house because it wasn't round. Um, and we actually have the number 29. That's that locomotive right there. Um, and really, they, they held an empire unto themselves. And this was the Scotia Bluffs. Hammond Lumber Company, that's the, num that's the number 15, the Big George locomotive that was at the Sequoia Park for a while. Uh, this is, these are the Samoa shops, and I'm showing you all these just because I think it's important to recognize how many little railroads were feeding the big railroad after uh, consolidation. It's just staggering. And it really was mainline business. Uh, 1929, the line was sold entirely to Southern Pacific. Uh, steam was replaced by diesel, and business continued to boom. Um, and it did fluctuate um, a little bit uh, to coincide with the Depression, but after the 1950s, or after the war, 1950s, there was a giant boom in business, and redwood flowed to all corners of the world. Now, I'm just going to uh, explain this really quick, because I think this is so important, just to emphasize how uh, profitable this railroad once was. So this is from my buddy Josh Buck, his uh, thesis paper, which is excellent. Um, <coughs> So this man, uh, James Vale, who was just a boy when his father took him to the small town of Dos Rios uh, for two weeks during the summer vacation in 1952, recalled the experience with the right-of-way during the post-war boom. I assumed that a few trains would pass through, uh, or pass with long, frustrating intervals, but I was wrong. We hadn't even finished unpacking when a northbound freight clanked into town. Soon that train whistled off, but ten minutes later, uh, another pulled up to the tank, and the ritual was reenacted, the water tank. The trains came in steady procession. One day, while we were swimming in the river, I noticed two trains pulling the town from opposite directions. There seemed to be some confusion as to which one would, which to, um, which one would take the siding, but uh, before the issue could be decided, two more trains arrived, apparently following sections. That made four trains in town at once. Then another showed up. Finally, after much sawing back and forth, the traffic jam cleared up and Dos Trios went back into its usual uh, some nods. So, um, this is actually Dos Rios, 1964. Looks nothing like this now. Water tank is long gone. Because once we went to diesels, water tanks were no longer necessary. Um, but the station's also gone. The block signals are all gone. Uh, this is Fortuna. You can see a southbound, uh, that's a SD9 with a bunch of boxcars. Uh, Scotia Bluffs. This is a really hallmark picture because you can see the what they call the ash can headlight up on top, and then also on NWP they had spark arresters. Um, really, just like a, a such an NWP picture. And now we've we've walked a lot of this. It's what landslides. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah, <laughs> that's Manning Creek right there. Right? Yep, Manning Creek. Yep. <laughs> This is Lolita. You can see the number of, um, this is processed lumber heading south. So, time to get sad. Um, the Empire, which is no longer. Um, I wanted to figure out how did one of the most profitable railroads in the United States fall apart. This is my picture. Um, I went down uh, before they removed the fish, fish passage at Woodman Creek. It was a Caltrop project. They were moving it so that we can actually have access for the coho up the creek. I think that's fantastic. But I went because I wanted to see it before uh, they did the project. So they removed a large section of the right-of-way 
And if we can help the salmon, I'm all for that. So um, what I wanted to know is how this thing actually fell apart. Um, 1961, Lolita. It's worse now. Yeah. Um, this is tunnel 28. That's not the same spot, but that's Burger Creek. That's actually, that's not tunnel 28 either, that's tunnel 29. But um, yeah, really, roller coaster. And as you're going above it uh, from the air, it's like this continuously. So um, this continues. You go all through the canyon, and you see that the geology has just really taken over. That's a s uh, site of a derailment. And I've heard people kind of criticize the railroad for not uh, picking some of these things up. They were trying to survive in the later years. And nowadays, to remove a lot of the stuff, you would probably have to rebuild the tracks to go back in and remove the stuff. So it's kind of a catch-22. I think that a lot of people um, are upset about this, and rightfully so. That stuff shouldn't be in the river, but I don't know how we would remove it at this point. If you can't tell, that's dirt. It's all dirt. <laughs> what we would call a swinging track. In this case, the ties are also gone. That's Arcata. Someone decided to remove a culvert, and there's no trains running, so why put it back? Um, there's a graffiti artist in the North End who is quite talented, and this is actually inside the Lolita Tunnel. For once, I like graffiti on railroad stuff. <laughs> yeah. Pretty amazing. Um, this is just a quote from 99. What the NWP has already endured would make for a darn good made-for-television te soap opera, said Assemblywoman Virginia Strom Martin. The line has suffered a lot of pain, and it hasn't gotten a lot of help from the pe government people who should be helping it. So, things were good for a little while. 1964 happens. How many of you actually remember the 1964 flood? Okay, yeah. My dad didn't even live here, and he remembered the 1964 flood. Um, so, uh, December 1964, there was a very large snowpack, and then we experienced what we now call a Pineapple Express. Uh, warm rains melted the majority of it. Um, the rivers raged. Uh, as many of you know, we lost 101 North, South, 299, 36, all other connecting roads, and of course, the railroad. Uh, the railroad ended up losing um, about um, 100 miles of trackage. Here's the actual Island Mountain Bridge. Um, various spots along the canyon where you can see debris has just piled up. Um, the majority of this was just wiped into oblivion. Uh, from what I understand, they lost about 100 miles of functional trackage and about 30 miles of actual roadbed. It just ceased to exist. And I do have a picture of that from C.D. Neal in a second here. Um, this is the South Fork Bridge. If you've ever been dri driving along the highway, you might notice that this section here is dark brown. That's because it's rusty. It's from 1912 uh, or 13 uh, when they finished it. And the other section is from 1965, which is why it's silver. It's the Scotia Bluffs. That's probably not even the worst of the destruction. Um, what happened was that as the river actually went around and somewhat missed Scotia, it just ramped up along the bluffs and just turned the rest of it into oblivion. Um, this is actually a shot that I got while I was doing something very safe in a helicopter. Um, that's actually a piece of one of the bridges. Uh, there's actually debris from the flood, uh, bridges, rail cars, all sorts of stuff now embedded in the river. And it will stay there. So, uh, Southern Pacific made the decision to reopen the line. And they had to, because we didn't have roads coming to Humboldt at the time, because they were all destroyed. They were actually flying in groceries to uh, McKinleyville Airport. That's how dire it was. Uh, Cane Rock, Island Mountain, South Fork Bridges were all completely destroyed. Uh, Cane Rock uh, Bridge was severed on two sides and it was actually picked up a little bit. It wasn't totally destroyed. Um, the Island Mountain Bridge was wiped away from existence. And then the South Fork Bridge, as you saw, half of it was destroyed. Um, and many of the tunnels in the canyon were plugged with debris. And basically all the stations except for Fort Seward were gone. And Fort Seward is the only remaining one. 
Um, so Morrison Knudsen, tasked with rebuilding the line uh, to the flood ravaged communities in Humboldt, um, they kind of rushed the rebuild, and they had to. Um, I'm not knocking them, they had to do this because the company needed to get back up and running. The purpose of a railroad is to run trains, and you can't do that if the tracks are decimated. Um, so they brought uh, equipment in from all over the West Coast. Over 800 people worked on it, and it uh, cost them about $11 million. Um, the original cost of the line in 1914 was $14 million, just to give you an idea. And these are some pictures from C.E. Neal. I think these are just amazing. Uh, no roadbed. It's all gone. You can see just a little bit of track hanging down. This is the original roadbed. This section, that's the base rock. Where is that? That's like, uh, this is milepost uh, 211. So this is deep in the canyon. Uh, that would be, um, that's 13 miles north of Vinyl Mountain. Steelhead. What's that? Steelhead. Steelhead. That's Steelhead? Um, this is the Island Mountain Bridge. This is milepost 194. You can see them actually rebuilding it. Um, they decided to go to the more upright style where the train actually passes through it. Um, and they rebuilt built this very quickly. Uh, this is Cane Rock. Uh, the lower sections were actually destroyed. The bridge was knocked over just a little bit. Uh, so just to give you an idea of how monumental this task was. And this is actually before they finished the rebuilding of South Fork. You can see this section is now gone. Um, if you can't see the caption, this, this redwood log sticking out of there. It says, South Fork Bridge, debris and trusses, redwood tree hanging from the bridge was 967 years old. And the amazing thing, just to give you an idea of how much they wanted to get this railroad back open, they actually had to do a special process to pour the, uh, the pillar. Um, there was a pillar that sort of had to be freestanding in the river, and because the old one was so decimated, they actually had to um, completely rebuild it. And from what I understand, um, reading some things from the superintendent at the time, it was the most expensive piece of concrete NWP ever poured. It was, was $750,000 in 1965. Yeah, and it's massive. I stood underneath it and it's like, uh, So they ended up rebuilding 100 miles in 177 days. Compare that to uh, 1907 and 1914, a little different. And of course we had modern tools and uh, more people, but... Uh, so they were desperate for transportation. Um, and the problem that I saw originally, and this is one of the reasons why I thought the railroad had shut down, was the fact that they didn't really uh, use any... They didn't do a lot to address some of the initial problems of the canyon. They looked at rerouting it, but it wasn't possible. The purpose was to get trains running again, so they rebuilt it in the same spot. Um, but no matter what, landslides and washouts continued to plague this line. This is a little bit later. This is the Scotia Bluffs. You can see mud just constantly um, covering it. There's sections of NWP that they just refer to as a mud glacier. There's a spot called 201, they call it the 201 slide. It's a 7,000 foot long mud glacier. And every time it rains heavily, it'll start to slide. Um, but despite these issues, from 64 to 78, there weren't many major incidents, nothing like the 64 flood. Um, and business was relatively stable as long as landslides and washouts were kept at bay. This is one of those things where you have to continue to do this kind of work. Uh, Scotia Bluffs had many people working full time just to maintain that. So they continued uh, steam to diesel. You can see this is the Willits Roundhouse. Uh, here's the Bud Car at Eel Rock. Um, but really, it's never ending. Um, the repairs had to be done daily. Work was at an as needed basis. Uh, when landslides and culverts continued to get worse, the dollar cost got higher and higher. And that's one of the things about the current state of the canyon. It's okay, you can look at it now and say, oh, they never should have built a railroad here. Well, it's been sitting for 20 years. I challenge anyone to consider what Highway 101 would look like if we let it sit for 20 years. It's just we have a lot of government funding to take care of the highway. Um, so preventive maintenance was key. Now, this is uh, what I view as one of the things that really spell the end of this <coughs> So September 6, 1978, the line would never be the same. Uh, crews working at Isla Mountain noticed heavy smoke pouring from the south portal of the tunnel, um, which was 4,314 feet long. Um, so it's almost a mile long. Um, it's tunnel number 27. 
So dry redwood timbers had actually caught a spark and were burning out of control. And from what I've read, um, they actually called in fire cars from as far away as Roseville, which is part of the Southern Pacific system. Um, and there were engineered fire breaks where they would actually have concrete in certain sections to prevent fire from spreading. Problem was is that the fire was actually getting behind the timbers and it started burning behind the concrete. And you couldn't even spray water on it if you wanted to. Um, and it made it totally impossible to even wet the fire. And because when a fire burns that hot inside a tunnel, it creates its own draft in the same way that a steam locomotive makes a draft, um, it made it impossible to enter. And back to those fire doors. From what I have read, um, in the summer of 1978, uh, roughly before the time of the actual tunnel fire, the uh, doors were removed. And they removed them to put them on some other tunnel that was deemed to be more important. Oops. <laughs> I don't know if they really would have helped that much because the tunnel is so long. Um, you can actually see this is the north end same deal, fire doors. So they tried using foam, water,